Well, welcome Palm City. I am so excited to be up here and be with you today to make much of Jesus because that's what it's all about. So let's go ahead and give him the highest praise before we get started. Yes. What a privilege and honor it is to be up here on this stage before you today. It's quite different from my normal vantage point of the front row, leaned in to learn and cheer on Pastor Brian. Grateful for the opportunity, honey. Thank you for that awesome intro. Um, but glad to be here with you today. And I'm excited because I've always wanted to stand here and teach an entire book of the Bible, and that's what we're going to do today. Yeah. And so go ahead and breathe easy because it's going to be Jonah, y'all, and that is four chapters. Anybody can walk through four chapters, and we're going to do that together today. And if you brought your Bible, I want you to go ahead and open it up. You can follow along with your phone or as the scriptures are on the screen behind me. Do take notes. This is a note-taking church. We're leaned in, and we are ready to go. So open your Bibles, and we're going to start out in Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from, the door, flee from the Lord. Running from God will always cost you something. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to stand here today. Lord, help us lean into this word that you have for us, lean into the scripture. Lord, let it be for us, not our neighbor, not the person that's not here, but help us evaluate ourselves today. Lord, let the words go forth from your page, your scripture, and my mouth to accomplish the purposes for which you sent today, that it would not return null and void, but it will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yes. So I think this whole book, I could save us a lot of time, can be summed up in one sentence. God said go, Jonah said no, and God said oh. And I really felt familiar with that because Pastor Brian said preach, I said no, and he said oh, and well, you see how that worked out for me, here I am. So all of us are running or hiding from something, possibly running towards something, and I am a queen runner. I love to run. Bless my poor little family. Everywhere we go, London can testify to this. I have one speed, and it's usually too fast, and I'm trying to beat my time everywhere we go. If we're at Disney in the line, it is likely that I am right next to you, breathing down your neck, because not only am I going to get there fast, you are too if you're in front of me. If there is a drive through restaurant that has two lanes in the drive through I am assessing from the onset who is moving faster. I am weaving in and out to achieve greatness at the window. If I am at a show and I have bad seats, which that's highly likely because bad seats are cheap seats. Yes, and I might not like bad, but I sure do like cheap. So you will see me become like a mole in the game of whack-a-mole where I start bobbing up and down, moving my things, moving to the front to get to the seat set. I know God created just for me. <laughs> yes, I like to hide too, don't get me wrong. When the kids were little, we had this game at home called hit the floor. It goes like this. The doorbell rings and I hit the floor. And I don't know what it is about a doorbell, but when it rings, it's like the world is over. Who could possibly be coming? My laundry's out, things have to be done, and now they know. Now they know. So then I begin to crawl to the door and take the long trek to what I call safe zones. Safe zones in my home are places where I can see you, but you cannot see me. <laughs> and I get to the window where I have it next to the door, and I peer right out of the window to see that nine times out of ten, my fears are relieved. It's just an angel described as an Amazon guy bringing me the packages that I had been waiting for all along. Instant relief. My best friend Rachel knows this so much about me that when the kids were babies, I literally had a door, um, a door hanger that she made, very Pinteresty like and it said, do not ring my doorbell. I have napping babies, and if you wake them, you're going to take them. And I meant that. Yes. 
So there are three reasons. I am a pastor's wife, so you have to know I, too, have been conditioned to see things in threes. But I think there's three reasons that we can learn from in Jonah's story why it is when God asks us to do something that that alarm goes off in our heart and we trigger the fail-safes to say, shut it down, that fight or flight that intentionally keeps us from God's best. The first thing I think we can learn is perspective. It's not that Jonah didn't understand his assignment. Oh, he understood the assignment. Is that not how they say it? Understood the assignment. (laughs) Yes. Um, Nineveh, he just didn't like it, y'all. He he understood it, but he didn't like it. And Nineveh, in modern-day terms, was like a city of terrorists. It was the capital city of Assyria, full of barbarians that would literally cut your head off. I do not blame Jonah for not wanting to go. I would have been on a ship going the wrong direction as well. But he didn't want to go because he didn't feel like the people there deserved God's grace. He knew that the wickedness had come up before the Lord and they deserved to be punished for the things that they had done. And if he had gone and preached repentance, then things would have turned around and they would not have been wiped off the earth. And so, you see, Jonah had a poor view of God's grace. Now, he didn't see it at the time like he was running. It wasn't like it was live tweeted, live streamed, like, hey, this is your boy Jonah. I'm headed down to job. I'm running. No, it was learned in hindsight. It was learned after. It was learned after that he had the results of his rebellion or experienced the transformative power of his repentance. It was even learned after he walked through some bitterness, which we'll talk and learn more about later in this story. It was after all those things that he was able to say, yeah, you know what? I was running. Verse 3 says, Jonah went down to Joppa. From Joppa, he goes down to Tarshish, down to Tarshish, and down to the bottom of a ship, down to the stomach of a fish, down to the bottom of the sea. Because when you choose to walk in a different direction, other than the direction that God has given you, I can promise you that direction is only going to lead to down. I thought it was interesting when I was studying the story of Jonah. I did not know this. Maybe you did. But he was only asked to go 500 miles from where he was. And he ended up boarding a ship and going 2,500 miles in the wrong direction as far as he could go. And by the time the boy got his head on straight, he ended up taking it 5,000 miles because he had to go right back to where he started. How many of you know that sometimes you have to work harder to disobey God than just do what he said in the first place? We like to tiptoe towards disobedience. And for those of you that don't know, disobedience is sin. We like to tiptoe towards it. He said, I'm just going to go here instead. I'm just going to tiptoe towards this. Lot was a character like that too in Genesis. He just liked to tiptoe. He wanted to set his camp up outside of Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm not in it but I'm just outside. I'll just tiptoe on the outside just to fall in and lose my dignity, my life, and everything I own. Sin will always take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to spend. I'm going to repeat that for those taking notes. Sin will always take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you're willing to spend. Having the wrong perspective will deceive you into making the wrong choices and going the wrong direction. And it may seem temporary. It always seems temporary in the moment. But let me tell you, it has permanent consequences. Sometimes you can't know you're running until the storm hits. Chapter 1, verse 4 through 5 says, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. And such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to their own God. And then they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone below deck, he's hiding, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. How many of you have had a season where God told you to do something, but you did everything within your power not to do it? I know I have, and from time and time again, I ended up just like Jonah. What happens is you can get so tired from resisting the small steps, sometimes big steps that God's asking you to take, that you just lay down your dreams to rest. You know, you get so stuck in the should have, would have, could have, maybes, what ifs, the buts, the negative words that are spoken, the dreams that didn't come to realize, that you say, you know what, it's easier for me just to give up and put this thing to sleep. And the problem with being asleep is that you can be asleep and not even know it. 
Have you ever fallen asleep on your couch, just dozed off? And then somebody's like, dude, you were asleep for like an hour and a half. And you're like, really? That was like a minute. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a queen sleeper in my home. I cannot stay awake past 9 p.m. for nothing. My friend Jenny, she's a 3 a.m. girl. I'm highly jealous of that. But if I lay down flat in my house, I have strategically learned to place pillows and keep one eye opened, the side that is visible to Pastor Brian, because he will starkly be like, are you kidding me? Are you going to sleep? And I'm like, no, no, I'm not asleep. I'm just resting my eyes. That's what my dad used to say. I'm just resting my eyes. I'm not asleep. I don't know what it is about us humans, but we love to deny when we're asleep. If you have kids, you know this. They deny it. You fell asleep in the car. No, I didn't. Yes, we love to deny it. And so you can see you can either be asleep and not know it, or even if you do, you can deny it. But God will send a great storm. And listen, he does this from time to time. He'll send you a storm of correction. Maybe you're headed down the wrong path. He'll send a storm of protection. It's not a pretty storm. It doesn't look good, but it's for your good. He can even allow you to be caught up in a storm of tragedy. Maybe something happened. It wasn't fair. It doesn't make any sense. And now you're caught up in that story, and he uses that so you can evaluate where you are on your journey. Because the thing about God is he is not going to allow you to stay content in your complacency. He won't do it. Romans 13, 11 through 12. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let's put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. The next thing is huge that keeps us, that alarm goes off. I can't do it because I have polluted relationships. At this point in the journey, the sailor realized the things they were experiencing, this wicked storm was not because of something they did, but because of Jonah himself. They called out to their God to save them. It's funny how in, a, in chaos we have this knee-jerk reaction that it's like, oh God, where are you? And that can be a great thing if you're calling on the right God. But they didn't have the right God. So they cast lots and they drew, that's like drawing straws, if you will, to determine who the culprit was. And you guessed it, the culprit's Jonah. So we go to chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. And it says, so they ask him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all of this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And then Jonah answers very confidently and assuredly, I imagine, I am Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made this sea and the dry land. See, Jonah here is a perfect example of knowing the things of God but not living it. This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running from the Lord because he had already told them that. And then they said, who are you and where do you come from? Basically, what planet are you living on that you would run from a God this powerful? And we can say the same thing about us. A God this awesome. What? What is it that could possibly keep us from taking steps in his direction? They had heard of this God, and they were wondering those things. But some of you or in a storm, not because of what you did, but because of who you have on your boat. I've preached this to students before, and I just called it, throw your Jonah overboard. Get him off your ship. Jonah may not be in your boat, but he may be sliding up in your DMs. And for parents, let me help you out. DMs is like the email version. <laughs> DMs is the email version of social media. You may want to check into that. He may be whispering in your ear, or maybe subconsciously you feel like, if I hang out with this Jonah, whether it be a guy or a girl, I'm going to be more popular, and it has promising things. But let me tell you from someone who's been there and bought the T-shirt, there is a way that seems right, but it leads to destruction. And so Jonah knows. He tells them, there's only one way out of this. I already know. You're just going to have to throw me overboard. You're going to have to get rid of me. And so verse 13 goes on to say, instead... They did their best to row back to land. So rather than getting rid of him, they tried to find a happy medium. They knew that they couldn't do this because the storm grew greater and greater. And I think sometimes we have a tendency when we're stepping into the things of God to try and find a happy medium. 
Maybe I can uh, keep my habits in check and still hang out with this person. Maybe if I just cut down my time with them and I'm only with them one day a week, this. And we think if we don't cancel the person, we'll be able to keep our own habits in check. But let me tell you, that's not the way it works. If I was to come to the end of this stage and pick out any one of you, you could easily drag me down much faster than I would ever be able to pull you up to the standard that's here. That's how that works. It's hard. It's hard work. Proverbs 25, 26 says, Like a muddied fountain and a polluted spring, a righteous man yields, is a righteous man who yields, who compromises, who makes concessions, and compromises his integrity before the wicked. So they decided to listen. They threw him overboard, and guess what? Just like he said, the storm stopped. And at that point, when they finally obeyed, they were able to hear from the Lord and make sacrifices unto him. And I think today we might have people in this room that might need to make some sacrifices today. I think it's safe to ask the Lord, is there something or someone in my life that I need to cast off? Is there something in my life that I need to drown before it drowns me? Today's city group start, just like Brian said, the directory's online. This is the perfect place to make sure you've got the right people on your boat. The next one is our prerequisites. This is a big one. This is a soapbox up here, I think, because our prerequisites, we have so many of them. So something happens next in the story that I like to call sushi in reverse. God provides a great fish to come and eat Jonah. And so they swallows him up. And you know what? I bet Jonah didn't feel this way. I do not think he felt like, oh, this is a great fish. This is a great thing for me. The well story is about a great rescue. Has God ever rescued any of you from a situation that you created for yourself? Right? (laughs) Come on. Let's be honest. And it didn't look like what you thought. How he rescued you was not your plan for yourself. He sends a great whale, and you're like, nah, I'm good. I'm going to wait on the cruise ship. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm going to wait on the cruise ship. Did you know they have a club on the cruise ship for my kids? That is amazing. And they provide food, and they have ice sculptures, and there's just so many choices because I get so bored when it comes to my food. And there's so many stops. There's so many places we can go, which is great because I need to rest and focus on my needs. And the best part about all of it is these cruises are like three to five days, which is really good because anything more than that feels like too much of a commitment. <laughs> and while I'm at it, just go ahead and send me that Royal Caribbean. So I have heard the Carnival cruise ship reeks of booze and smells like college teenagers, and I think I've just moved a little beyond that. So. Let me tell you, you might have an idea of what your journey can look like, but your preferences will deceive you every single time. Some of us miss God's provision because we are so picky. We are a picky little people. We are. And trust me, we have taken the Royal Caribbean. We have a cruise story. We do. It's a true story. Rained the entire time. And the ship ahead of us had this very unfortunate event where someone went missing and fell overboard. And there is a stop on the Royal Caribbean, which is why you take the Royal Caribbean called Coco Cay in the South. We say Coco Cay. And I was anything but okay when we couldn't take that stop because we had to search the water, so we had to miss it. And so um, I know that's so bad, but those were my preferences. That was my prerequisites. I wanted to check it off. Um, And maybe the biggest tragedy of all is uh, Brian and I didn't realize until the last night you had all-you-could-eat room service, and we missed it. But let me tell you, when you take a journey with God, it will always lead to an endless feast. It may be hard, it may be gritty, it may be tough, I can guarantee it will be. There might be detours you never planned, and you sure didn't plan on taking a whale, but it will always be worth it. I love this verse out of 1 Corinthians 15, 30 through 33. It's the message version, and I love it, because I think it gets the point across about how gritty and hard it is, but the point. What's the point of it all? And why do you think I keep risking my neck in this dangerous work? I look death in the face practically every day that I live. Do you think I'd do this if I wasn't convinced of your resurrection and mine as promised by Messiah Jesus? Do you think I was trying to just act heroic when I fought the wild beast at Ephesus hoping it wouldn't be the end of me? Not on your life. 
It's resurrection, resurrection, it's always resurrection. We eat, we drink, and we die, and that's all there to it. But don't fool yourselves and don't let yourselves be poisoned by this anti-resurrection talk. Bad company ruins good manners. Think straight. Awaken to the holiness life. No more playing fast and loose with resurrection fact. Ignorance of God is a luxury you can't afford in times like these. I love this last line. Don't you just wish you could talk to people like this? Aren't you embarrassed that you've let this kind of thinking go on as long as you have? (laughs) I love how the verses directly link bad company with not propelling the gospel forward. We have to stop needing everything to check off our list and start asking God, what does his look like? Your journey is not about you. We are not the point. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the point. As it turns out, Jonah had his prerequisites, and it turns out he was highly effective in preaching to people that he didn't like and a crowd that he didn't want to go to. When he finally obeys, not only does he preach, he reaches the Assyrians, And there was great repentance in the land. It even says that the king stepped down from his throne, tore off his robes, sat in the dirt as to say, Oh God, who am I compared to your greatness? And sometimes I think Jonah made a boatload, pun intended, of assumptions about who, what, when, how God will and won't bless. And I think he may have did that because like us, Jonah, we think, we think God has his favorites. We think he saved the cruise ship for her, and he saved the cruise ship for him, and I'm just stuck down in this whale on my journey, and it stinks on my journey, and it's not fair. But God's not like that. He says, you choose your journey. You choose your vehicle. You choose your destination. It's my prayer today that by the time you walk out of these doors and go back to your life and live, that you have the conviction of heaven come upon you and say, it is time. Today, it is time for you to get going in the right direction. It's time to change your course and stop dwelling in the bottom of a boat. You need to change how close you are to the things of God. See, God is attracted to movement. So now we know that we have to gain God's perspective. His word says his ways are higher than our ways. We've got to get the right people on our boat And we have to deny ourselves and take up the cross and lay down our preferences and pick up him. Well, how do we do that? As Pastor Brian says, I'm so glad you asked. (laughs) You have to acknowledge your position. It's time to get grateful. You have to turn the tide. You'll see in chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, that Jonah got grateful and he got out. It says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be there. And in doing so, they turn away from God's love for them. That just wrecks me, y'all, that the longer I cling on to my people and my preferences and my wrong perspective, that I miss out and I forfeit. I give up what's already mine and give it back, the purposes and the plans. And then it says, I turn from God because he's never turned from you. It's your choice. But Jonah, it says, but I, with shouts of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good on. I will say salvation comes from the Lord, and at that, the Lord commanded the fish and vomited Jonah onto dry land. See, thankfulness almost always precedes the blessings in your life. Gratitude is a gateway to provision. The Greek word for thanksgiving is eukaryisto. It literally means the breaking of something, like you break it apart, and it produces a thankfulness that ushers you into a miracle of God. We see this at the wedding when Jesus gave thanks and moments later he fed 5,000. You see it again at the Last Supper table where he's with his disciple. He breaks bread and gives thanks only for the miracle of heaven to be conquered three days later on the cross for anyone that would believe. And again, three days in the belly of a fish, Jonah breaks, gives thanksgiving, and he gets out. The word says God provided the fish. We have to start looking at the problem as our provision. Next, you've got to get going. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. You know what? I'm so glad that we serve a God that gives us multiple chances. 
Chapter 3, verse 3 says, It came to him a second time. Jonah obeyed the Lord of the Lord and went. Now, there's a novel thought. I think this time he thought, I'll do this one right. <laughs> Lean into this. It says, Nineveh was a very important city. It required a visit of three days. If you remember, Jonah was in the belly of darkness and despair for three days. Sometimes if you want to be an agent of change and revival in God's story, it's going to have to take a little of what I call dark training. Joshua 1.3 says, Every place that the sole of your foot treads upon, I have given to you as I have promised Moses. The Hebrew word for tread is derek. It means to war. It means to march. It literally means ch -ch -ch, load your weapons. And so, meaning everywhere you set your foot, everywhere you tread, everywhere you've warred, every belly of every fish that you have crawled through well vomit and come out on the other side, you have now been given the authority for your assignment. You have all you need. The darkness you experience in your past will always meet you in your future, and you will be prepared. Just to further prove how God, far God will go to prepare his people to hear from him, the city of Nineveh worshipped a god called Dagon. It literally means massive great fish. So you better believe that when a prophet gets spit out of what looks like their god onto the dry land, they are leaned in and ready to repent. It says everyone turned at the preaching of repentance. Even the king came down. When God saw hearts turn towards him, he had compassion on them, and he canceled the destruction that he had planned. If you're going to be prepared for this journey, you're going to have to get a little grit. I wish Jonah's story finished with an epic, tidy ending. I'm a girl that likes to read last chapters first to see if it's even worth it, y'all. This one is just stupid. I wish I could say he had the best attitude, but he turned out to be more like a legendary loser. See for yourself, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. You see, he was mad. He didn't like those people, and to him it seemed wrong. He did what God said, but he did it with a bad attitude. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? that I was tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. It'd be better for me to die than live. It's interesting to see that Jonah was angry at God for saving the people. He had shown the people the same mercy that he had previously shown Jonah, and he wasn't happy about it. How quickly we can go from rescue me from this fish, I'll do anything, to this isn't going my way, I'm going to throw a pity party, and I would rather die. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat at a place of east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. He decided better for him in his anger to just take his things and go set up camp outside of his community. I'm just going to put myself in time out and have a pity party because they said this. They didn't do this. It's not going my way. But then the Lord of God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. Now he's happy. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun arose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint and wanted to die. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. I'm so angry, I wish I was dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you have done nothing to tend to it or make it grow. Isn't that the truth? It's so easy to be opinionated about the things that we have yet to be invested in. It sprang up overnight, it died overnight, and should I not have concern for a great city of Nineveh in which there is more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. And you're over here upset about a plant. So here it is, he's isolated, mad, and hot. If you're a female in this room, you know what being mad and hot feels like. It's just no good. 
Uh, and just like the whale, God provided again. He provided a plant because, see, he knows what your needs are. He knows when you need comfort. He knows when enough is enough. He sent the plant. But when he saw that Jonah had comfort, he sent the worm. And he sent it to eat away at the plans that you've made for yourself to show you there's holes in it like Swiss cheese that will never be filled with anything but him. The worm and the whale are God's design to push you back into your purpose. I see this with a generation of students we have rising up in the church, and and really even adults, all of us really. It's hard. They have more options than any generation to ever walk through this door. We have more options, and we can't even get off the starting block because we're afraid. We've been raised on soundbite theology that says you have one purpose. You better find your one purpose. I hear it all the time. I just don't think that's my purpose. I tried that for a minute, and it wasn't my purpose. I really want to do something big for Jesus. And it, I hear it all the time, and it's, it's sad. Students, will you hear from me today, if nothing else, that Jesus is your purpose? Parents, Jesus is your purpose. At school, Jesus. Behind the lens of a camera, Jesus. On the field, in the locker room, at work, in a relationship, it's Jesus. Jesus is our message. It's the first value we have as a church. The thing, the vehicle is not it, and it never was designed to be it. It's gritty. It's hard. Jesus said, take up your cross and deny yourself. And I think as a church, we should say that more. It's tough. There's a great cost to being a Christian. The mission is too great to not pay it. But if we don't prepare you for what you're signing up for, at the first sign of resistance, or at this first sign of something doesn't check off my prerequisites, you'll be running for the hills trying to hide up underneath a plant to get comfort and die. The world desperately needs you. It needs your talents. It needs your giftings. It's gritty. It's time to load your weapons and dig deep. I'll finish with this. Ever since I was a little girl, I have always been drawn to the things of Jesus. I showed up to my first grade show and tell with Bible in hand, to share the word of the Lord. And from that day forward, I would spend the rest of my life just completely running and hiding, knowing the things of Jesus, but like Jonah, not living it. 9-11 hit when I was in college in my first year, and my roommate came to my room, and she said, "Um, hey, if all this is going on and this is how we're going down, I need to tell somebody that nobody's ever told me about Jesus. And I was like, what? You never heard about him? And she's like, can you tell me? And I was like, yes, I can because I'm a Christian. So I went back to my bedroom and I did what every college student does and I bent down and pulled all the junk out from underneath my bed. And I thought surely I had brought a Bible to college. And I went to my refrigerator, I grabbed a beverage, I grabbed a pack of smokes and I went and met her on the front porch and I started in Genesis 1-1. And I found out quickly a few sentences in that I didn't know Jesus, I didn't know where his story started. So I did the next logical thing, and I called a local church. And I kid you not, the conversation went like this. Um, Hi, I am, I'm Kristen. Yes, um, I'm a Christian. And um, my name, literally, Kristen, means follower of Christ, anointed one, so there's that. But uh, anyways, anywho, I'm a Christian, and my roommate, she's not. And she has some questions about this whole 9-11 thing, so I was thinking we need a professional to come out. Can you send a professional? And that person showed up at our door. And I'll never forget, they looked me in the face and they asked me a question and I'll never forget it. They said, Kristen, would you like to stick around and watch a miracle of God happen? And my response was, no, I'm good. I'm a Christian. I'm I'm already a Christian. I'm going to go back to my room. Jennifer got saved that day. She gave her life to the Lord. Within 12 hours, she had broken at least 100 CDs like split them in half. It was like the things to do. You, you find Jesus and you get rid of your music back then. And I was like, oh, don't do, th- don't do that to Britney Spears, please. <laughs> Not REM. I'll take that one. She had me call her boyfriend that she had spent every day with for four years through high school and break up with him for her. And I remember calling him and saying, hey, yo, Jennifer is a Christian like us now, but I think she's gone off the deep end. I'm pretty sure of it. She left school the next morning, left me high and dry without a roommate, and enrolled two hours away in a ministry college at a local church. And for four years, I would continue to run until I got tired of pretending like I was a Christian. And I called Jennifer because she had been consistent in her faith. Being consistent will do a lot of things for a lot of other people in your life. And she said, hey, no worries. You save me and I'm going to save you right back. 
She said, come to my church. So I got involved in a city group. She took me to one. I learned to trust people and just be real and take off the mask. I took all my bad habits in a brown paper bag and set them in the middle of the room on that coffee table. And I think all their faces are like, I was like, I just need some help. Like, I've never had anybody to walk me through this. This is all new to me. And that's exactly what they did. And life has never looked the same. You see, I had been spending a lifetime fleeing to Tarshish, and God had been in Nineveh all along. And I want to end with this verse right here. Sums it up best. Philippians 3, 8 says, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else. Everything. I count it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. So if you're not running after him because of something, it's garbage. What's garbage? Everything that's not of him. And maybe today it's just time to take the trash out. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the honor and privilege of leaning into you today. Lord, help us gain your heavenly perspective. Let us gain the right people, Lord, and have the guts to set aside the ones that are not taking us anywhere on our journey. Lord, let me lay down my list and pick up yours and have the obedience and bravery to step into the things you've called. To help develop a grateful heart, God. Help me get going. And Lord, help us develop some grit so when times get tough, we don't get taken out because the call is worth it. If you would just keep your head bowed. Maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe you're on a boat headed in the wrong direction. Quite possibly you're on a boat and you just realize I don't even have Jesus on it like me. Then today I want to give you the opportunity to turn the tide, get going in the right direction. Be bold, be brave today. God's with you. I'm going to count to three and if that's you, raise your hand and I want to lead you through a prayer. One, two, three. Three. Thank you, thank you. Jesus, we give this all up to you. If you raised your hand today, or even if you didn't, maybe, maybe you said the prayer in your heart, but you didn't raise your hand, I want everybody to say this for the sake of those around them and walk through this prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you for opportunities and second chances. God, I am sorry for going my own way and taking my own ship, Lord. I will lean into you and walk this life out with you. Lord, help me through the sanctification process. This is just the starting block. But your word says you will never leave us or forsake us. And today, from this day forward, I will live to make a difference for you. In Jesus' name.